Today is the seventh study in our current series on death, the final enemy, as 1 Corinthians 15.26 makes it clear that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And today we want to search the scriptures together in answering some further questions about death. And so let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Sarah Winchester lived in San Jose, California a number of years ago, and she was deathly afraid of dying. She was the heir of the famous Winchester repeating rifle fortune, and when her husband died, he left her millions of dollars to her account. But because of her fear of death, she became a a ready prey for con artists and quacks. And one of them convinced her that she needed to keep building onto her mansion in order to somehow cheat death. And this is what she did. Sarah did not want to die, for she feared death, and she feared what came after death. And one con artist convinced her that if she would just keep building onto the house, somehow she could escape the inevitable. So she did that, of what she was led to believe. And for 30 years, the saws and the hammers were kept constantly working on her house. As you are shown today from room to room, you will see that the Winchester house is a weird place with many odd features, like steps and doors that go nowhere. At her instruction, workmen built rooms with mystic symbols on the walls, probably appealing to the occult. Thirteen bathrooms were installed. Every room had 13 windows. Every window had 13 panes. Now that's superstitious. But one dreadful night, the inevitable happened. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, and Mrs. Sarah Winchester did just that. She died. Her effort to cheat death had failed, and today the house upon which she spent millions is just a curious tourist attraction called the Winchester Mystery House. When one does not believe the truth of the word of God, they replace it with a myth like Sarah Winchester believed. A dead-end street, a staircase that leads nowhere, ultimately. And as I think of her staircases that were, went nowhere, I'm reminded of a verse in Proverbs 14 and verse 12. How there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And as we've been thinking about this subject of death, we spent the last few studies studying the scriptures together as we consider some important questions we need to answer about death, such as what happens after death? Or why do Christians die? And what will death result in for every believer? And how can you respond in the face of death to the death of a believer? Or how can you respond in the face of death regarding the death of an unbeliever? And now today, let's ask and answer the question, What should the reality of death cause you to do? And let me recommend seven issues you need to address before you die. If you really believe you're going to die one day, unless you were part of the rapture generation, generation, and even so come Lord Jesus, the reality of death should cause you to, first of all, to be certain that you have been saved by God's grace and presently possess eternal life that you are certain that you've been saved by God's grace and presently possess eternal life. We begin reading in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you, you believers at Ephesus, he's made alive spiritually, who were prior to your salvation, dead spiritually in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children, not of God, but children of wrath, just as the others. So what can we do? Well, nothing but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us all sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show, he might put on display the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul here is writing to believers who were spiritually dead, but who heard the gospel at a point in time and placed their faith in Jesus Christ so that he could say without question, for by grace you have been saved. I can see I'm going to have to do something here. Let's do this again. Those of you who are listening to the tape, Later, you're wondering what is going on. What is going on is we're rebooting here. Whoops. So that we are ready for the latest and greatest. There we go. Remember every one of these? <laughs> See what your memory is like, okay? There you go, okay. And so these hopeless, helpless, and hellbound sinners heard the gospel, and Paul said without question, for by grace. Oops. For by grace. What is grace again? Grace is God's unmerited favor. You, you who are believers, have been saved. Notice, done deal, settled, assured. And by the way, can you know if somebody else is saved? Well, Paul believed they were. You can know someone else is saved, though in some cases we might not know. You've been saved through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus Christ. And that salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, paid for by Christ, offered in love, received through faith alone. And it's not of works Good works, religious works, the kind of things people would trust to try to get their good to outweigh their bad, hoping that one day they might make it to heaven, lest anyone should boast. For we, we who have been saved by grace through faith, we who were saved not by our works are now his workmanship. We presently are his workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus, that's our new identity for, it's a Hena clause here. This is introducing a purpose. Why did God save you? One of the purposes he saved you was for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should, not will, not would, but should walk in them. And thus it's a matter of faith in Christ, period, not faith in Christ plus. We were all on the broad road that led to hell whether it was the immoral lane, the moral lane, or the religious lane, it all ends up at the same destiny. And that's why Christ said, enter you in at the straight gate and enter the narrow way. And thus an individual, whether immoral, moral, or religious, if they are willing to believe the gospel and how Christ died for our sins, past, present, and future, and rose from the dead, in order to offer salvation as a gift, if they are willing to put their faith in Jesus Christ alone and what he did for them on that cross, 
They come through the door at that moment of faith in Christ. They have eternal life. So when they die, they know they're going to heaven because they have trusted the only one who could save them, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as a byproduct of being saved, God has a plan now for their life that does include good works. Not in order to be saved, not in order to stay saved, but because they've they've been saved and their salvation is secure. And that's why 1 John 5.13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that you may know that you have present possession. What? Eternal life. By the way, do you know that? Do you have that assurance? I've hammered on this a lot during this series because we can talk about other issues, and we will today, and secondary issues, but this is the bottom line. If you don't know you're saved, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, what do you ultimately have? And Christ wants you to know that. That assurance is based upon the word of God. It's because of the work of Christ. The recipients are those who believe in the name of the Son of God. Because Jesus Christ is the only Savior God ever provided. He's the only one who died as a substitute for your sins. He's the only one who rose from the dead to give you eternal life. If you've never put your trust in him alone, you can do that even right now. But the reality of death should not only cause you to be certain that you've been saved by God's grace and presently possess eternal life, but but number two, to prayerfully plan your funeral. To prayerfully plan your funeral. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, this is what we read. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. Now, the Lord usually doesn't give us heads up that you're going to die soon. Now, sometimes we have wake-up calls by way of physical difficulties, a heart attack, or so forth. But normally we don't. But one thing is clear, set your house in order, for you shall die, is still true even in our day. And while the application of this can maybe varied, I would like to apply it today uh, in, 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 in the sense of uh, planning your funeral, setting your house in order, having things in place so when you die, others don't have to make those decisions instead. And therefore, you may not have a funeral like this one, but it is wise nevertheless to plan your funeral prayerfully with details. You know, I'm reminded in Hebrews 11.22 how by faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. You see, Joseph died in Egypt. But he believed one day God's promise would be fulfilled and the people of Israel would enter the promised land. So he says, listen, wherever you go, take my bones with you and give me a proper burial in the land where I really belong, in the promised land. And he did that by faith. He planned his burial and in doing so, he communicated his faith in God's promise. And I would encourage you also to plan your funeral. And in doing so, use it as a time to communicate your faith and Jesus Christ. Perhaps a written testimony or appropriate music or your favorite verses and such. In fact, when I do a funeral, I oftentimes will ask, can I have the Bible of the believer so I can see what verses are underlined in there and even share that during the message. I'm reading from this person's Bible, and this is a verse they had underlined, which meant it was very important to them. Boy, that speaks volumes when you can do that. But frankly, dear friends, if you do not plan your funeral, someone else will have to plan it for you. And in some cases, it may be your unsafe family, and it may not turn out any way like you would really want it to be. You need to resolve questions like, where will it be at, or who will preach at it, and will the gospel be clearly presented? And what songs would you like sung? 
Do you want some congregational songs, specials? If so, by who? Do you have a preference? Do you want a time of sharing during it, as that's become more popular these days? Or maybe after it? Do you want a slideshow as part of it, as sometimes funerals include that these days? Will there be a luncheon following? Will there be a visitation before? How are you going to pay for it? And other issues that come into play as well. And frankly, when it comes to my own funeral, I've had it planned for a number of years. Now, I go back from time to time and change it. You know, there's a song I like now more than the one I had or, you know, or something like that. You know, somebody I like more than I used to or... <laughs> I, I, I'm joking there, you know. But, uh, but you understand. And again, if you don't plan it, somebody else has to plan it for you. You know, and so there's much wisdom. And I say this because sometimes people don't face this. I was talking to a believer just the other day who shared with me about a believer they know on the range. She's 89 years old. She's saved. She's still coherent. She's giving people the gospel. And when asked, have you planned your funeral? She said, no. I think my daughter might have some ideas. But uh, and I'm thinking, oh, take the opportunity to plan your funeral. Now, I'm not saying it's sin if you don't. I'm just saying I think there's wisdom in doing this. A third thing the reality of death should cause you to do is not only be certain that you've been saved and not only to prayerfully plan your funeral, but, but number three, to financially protect your family if possible. And it's not always possible, but if possible, to do just that. And go with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, the context of this is regarding widows. And widows that are widows in need, and thus widows indeed, those who do not have the means to support themselves. And this was a problem in the early church. And Paul writes these instructions in order to address this issue. Verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. Not only with respect, but with remuneration is the idea. But if any widow has children... Or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Let me pause for a minute. The first line of defense, the first line of physical or financial provision towards a person should be their family, not the church. It should be your own family. But that's where it needs to come from. Now, he continues. Verse 5. Now, she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But, who, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. In other words, that we would not give opportunity for the unsaved to criticize the Christian faith. Verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now notice here, and if anyone, in this context that anyone is a believer, does not provide, and in this case it's physical or financially, for his own, his own family, and by the way, this includes grandchildren, children, so forth, so it's extended family as well, and especially those of his own household directly, he has denied the faith. In other words, he is living in such a way that the truths of the word of God are being practically denied in his life. And he is worse than an unbeliever. Why does he say that? Because even unbelievers provide for their own. So why would a believer not do the same? And thus, this can involve various things, as I'm thinking of death, you know, maybe life insurance or financial accommodations of various kinds. And I have seen imbalances both ways on this. I've seen some people in the past who say, well, getting a life insurance policy is, is an act of unbelief because you don't believe the Lord will provide for you. And the truth of the matter is, cannot the Lord provide for you through a life insurance policy? Others who have made sure their kids were financially set up and yet they haven't invested the time and prayer and so forth to make sure their kids were spiritually well done. 
being, their needs being met. And again, this is where a will can come into place. Oftentimes that things can be communicated through that means so there isn't, you know, misunderstanding. Because frankly, dear friends, it can get ugly at times. You know, pretty soon people are fighting over who gets grandpa's, you know, uh, rocking chair or whatever, and there's these ugly battles and scars that sometimes last for years and years and years. And I'm thankful, even when it came to my own parents, my mother, having experienced this in her own family, resolved that that wasn't going to happen in ours, and therefore, she had everything parceled out. She even had the flowers picked out on her gravesite. I mean, she did it all there and had it planned so that there would be no misunderstanding and that family dynamics which can be very interesting at the time of death, hopefully would be smooth and by God's grace, whether it was the death of my mother or the death of my dad, um, the family dynamics have been good. You know, thinking of a, a, a will, Patrick Henry of American Revolutionary fame wrote this in his will. Listen to this. I have now disposed of all my property to my family. There's one thing more I wish I could give them, and this is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that, and I had not given them one shilling, they would be rich. And if I had not given them that, and had given them all the world, they would be poor indeed. Here's a man who understood providing for his own beyond the physical to the spiritual would be of the greatest importance. And so the reality of death should cause you to be certain you've been saved, to prayerfully plan your funeral, to pre financially protect your family, if possible. Number four, to wisely purpose to redeem the time. To wisely purpose to redeem the time. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. If you really believe you're going to die one day, unless the Lord comes, and again, even so come, Lord Jesus. If you really believe that, are you counting the days? Are you making the most of the opportunities? Or are you spiritually asleep? And I say that because Paul is writing to some believers who he feared were spiritually asleep. It's what I call the 20-year yawns. You know, you get everything's, the nov novelty is worn off, and so forth. And unless you're stirring up, a personal abiding fellowship with the Lord on a daily basis and the word of God is on the launching pad of your thinking so that it has a personal authority in your own life. You can fall asleep spiritually and really waste a lot of time that could be redeemed for the Lord. And that's why you read in verse 14, Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time, dear friends. Buying up the opportunities the Lord gives you in time to serve Him, to be a witness to Him, to invest in eternity where it really matters. Because the days are evil and the days are short. And so he says here, awake. Wake up is the idea. And why does he say that? Because there are believers who are sleeping. Is that going on in your life? Is the word of God, are you drifting farther from it? Prayers becoming more sporadic. You feel more comfortable with the unsaved than you do with the saved. When's the last time you said, by the grace of God, I'm convicted about this and by His grace and through His Spirit, I want to make an adjustment right here. Are you sleeping? If you wake up and you admit, this is where I've been and I'm turning to the Lord, Christ will give you light. And how does He give you light? He gives it through the Word of God. See then that you walk circumspectly. The idea here is carefully. Not as fools, too many walk like that, but as wise. By the way, where do you get wisdom? From the Word of God in prayer. Redeeming the time, 
making the most of the opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, literally, stop being unwise and start understanding what the will of the Lord is. Where is that going to be found? Again, in the word of God. So this appeal is all to go back and walk with the Lord and, and take in his word and enjoy fellowship with the Lord. And by the way, do not be drunk with wine. Now, the Bible does not condemn drinking. It condemns drunkenness. Though obviously you can't get to the other one without the other. In which is dissipation but be filled, keep on being filled with the Spirit. And it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we're learning to walk according to the will of God, as set forth in the Word of God, that we're going to be able to redeem the time and the opportunities the Lord gives us here. But we need to be aware of this, sensitive to it. The clock is ticking in your life and in mine. No wonder Moses, somewhere between 80 and 120 years old, writes Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And sometimes older people feel useless, trapped with fear. What purpose do I have in living? God still has a plan. Make those senior years count. Don't have a casino mentality, living for pleasure and waiting to die. Instead, run the basis, finish the race, fulfill your ministry, redeem the time. And to do so, do it by remembering the Creator in the days of your youth. While the day, evil days, the days of trouble come not. Now the years draw nigh, namely old age, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. It's tough to get up in the morning. Well, the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after rain. It speaks of days of decreasing joy and increasing gloom. And the days when the keepers of the house, arms and hands, shall tremble, and the strong men's shoulders and legs shall bow themselves, and the grinders, your teeth, cease. Because they are few. And those that look out the windows, namely your eyes, be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets. When the sound of the grinding is low, your hearing decreases. You know, I just spent some time in January down in Quartzsite, Arizona. You know, every other person down there, you had to say something twice. You know. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and inability to sleep. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low, voices soften. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, as older people get afraid of everything. And the almond tree shall flourish, hair turning gray and white. And the grasshopper shall be a burden, he walks slow. And desire shall fail, diminishing appetites. Because man goes to his lawn or his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets, namely grief at a funeral. Or ever the silver cord be loosed and the golden bowl be breaking. That's where they get this phrase in some of our hymns. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. Or the wheel broken at the cistern. These are all analogies of serious physical breakdowns. Then shall the dust, the dust of the body, return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The idea here is redeem the time. Don't wait until the end of your life to kick it in and serve the Lord. Remember now the Creator in the days of your youth is the idea. If you really believe you're going to get older and you're going to die one day, make the most of it now. Capture each day by walking in fellowship with the Lord and by His grace seeking to be faithful to what He's called you to do. But a fifth reality that death should cause us to do is to Sensitively seek to comfort the grieving. To sensitively seek to comfort the grieving. Because the reality is, more and more you're going to get to know people who are going to die. More and more you experience the death of your grandparents or your parents. Could be a spouse forthcoming. And you want to be able to help others in these times of grief. You know, it's like the 103 year old lady who was asked, do you have any comments about being 103? She said, well, there's no peer pressure. You know, 
In Job 16, verses 1 and 2, this is what Job said of his comforters. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. They were not of help to him. And I'll point out a little later why they were not. But we read in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Therefore comfort one another, how? With these words. It's good to be there for people. It's good to pray for them. But one of the greatest ways you can help comfort them is by reminding them of the character of God and the promises of the Word of God. And that's why having explained the rapture of the church, having then explained the day of the Lord and the coming tribulation period and how we will escape that, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Which reminds me again how sound doctrine allows you to comfort people by understanding the truth versus what is false. But there's a sixth thing that should be true of you and me in light of the fact that one day we're going to die. Namely, to be a witness for Christ by your lip and your life. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians, chapter 4. Colossians, chapter 4. One of the greatest ministries you can have for our Lord is the ministry of prayer. Don't ever underestimate it. Wherever you are, you can be involved in it. We read in verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now notice again the emphasis on prayer here, and to do it with thanksgiving, and praying specifically for other people beyond yourself, that God would open to us a door, speaks of an opportunity for what? The Word. You see, people might know that you claim to be a Christian by how you live, but no one is going to get saved by watching how you live. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And indeed, our lives should be a credible platform for which we preach the gospel from. But Paul was asking for prayer and an opportunity for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in chains, that I may make it manifest. And the word means clear. I make it, make it clear as I ought to speak. Pray for opportunities. Pray for boldness. Pray that we can make it clear as we ought to speak. And there's something greatly to be said for a clear presentation of the gospel. But then he also says, walk in wisdom to those who are on the outside. And the word walk speaks of your conduct. And so you want to walk in a way that's wise, that isn't a stumbling block to others. One that emphasizes what's important and isn't making secondary issues the issue. In fact, even on the job, as I've said before, Philippians says, do all things without grumbling and disputing that you may be a harmless children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. And so, if we really believe we're going to die and we really believe that God has us here in the meantime as a, an ambassador for Christ, should it not cause us to want to be a witness to the lost around us by our lives, and by our lips, preaching clearly the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've known employees who have blown their testimony on the job. I've known of bosses who have blown their testimony on the job. I know of landlords who have blown their testimonies in light of how they've handled things. I've known of 
renters who have blown their testimony in light of how they've handled things. Remember, the unsaved are watching. And while we can't sometimes reach lost souls on our feet, we can always reach them on our knees through prayer. And Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain, world's golden store, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he wants to burden our hearts for those precious souls for whom Christ died as well. But this leads us to a seventh response in light of the reality of death. Namely, that we should praise God for Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. In fact, go back with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Can you imagine facing death apart from knowing Jesus Christ? There would be no hope. There would be no assurance. And even the face of death should remind us how grateful we should be every day because of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Do you praise him for that? Do you thank him for it on a regular basis? Notice what Paul says in verse 3, right at the beginning of this epistle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The word blessed here means that of speaking praise to God. Our lives should be lives of worship as we walk in fellowship with the Lord. Lives of praise to God. For who? For Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. And how he has blessed us in him. And as he begins to enumerate these blessings, he mentions in verse 6 that all of this is to the praise of the glory of his grace. We haven't earned it or deserved it. We've been given it in gift form by which he's made us accepted in the beloved. What a wonderful assurance to know God accepts me because I'm in Christ. And he accepts me like his very own son. No wonder in verse 7 he says, In him we have redemption through his blood. And remember, his blood speaks of his finished work on that cross. When he died for us, when he died for our sins, when he died as our substitute. And not only do we have redemption through his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. And this is all according again to the riches of his grace. No wonder verse 12 then says, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. But do we have to wait till heaven to be filled with praise for Jesus Christ and what he's done? For we know in Revelation 5 that they're rejoicing in the redemption that is theirs through the blood of the Lamb. But we don't have to wait till heaven. Every day, our hearts should be filled with gratitude for Jesus Christ and his finished work, and especially in light of pending death, that is certain to come upon you and me, again, apart from the Lord's return. But having seen these seven responses that we should have in light of death forthcoming, it leads us to another question. Namely, who ultimately determines when you die? And the answer is, ultimately, it is the Lord. Ultimately, it is the Lord. Now, go with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. (laughs) And here we see Paul on Mars Hill. He is given the opportunity to speak to these philosophers who love sitting around just to hear some new thing. And while instead of compromising his convictions or finding some common ground by which he could stroke their flesh, instead he is very confrontational in his approach. And we pick it up in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, 
I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. You see, the Greeks were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. And so as Paul was going through Athens, he'd see an idol to this God, an idol to this God, an idol to this God. And someone came in with the idea, well, what if we've left one out? Well, let's just add this one, an idol to the -the fill-in-the-blank God, the unknown God. Verse 23 continues, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, personal pronoun, I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Why? So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And he goes on eventually to preach Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. But in declaring to them the one and only yet unknown to them God, he sets forth the creature creation distinction, underscoring how God is sovereign and man is to be subject to seek the Lord while he may be found. And he eventually, in this message, declares that this deceived first century think tank, that Jesus Christ and the resurrection is something they need to understand. But going back to verse 26 for a moment, he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the faces of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their... Notice who's determined it? He has. God has determined this. God is the one who determines pre-appointed times. God is the one who sets up the boundaries of their dwellings. This underscores the sovereignty of God, that God is on the throne, and that ultimately His will will be done, whether it's His perfect will, though in His permissive will, He does allow for sin and wrongdoing and various things, but even then, He's ultimately in control. And that's why in a time of danger, David said in Psalm 31, verse 15, my times are in your hand. But while he recognized that his times were in the Lord's hand, that didn't mean he didn't pray. He wasn't fatalistic about this. Instead, he says, deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Why? Because you're the one who sovereignly determines the time I die. And so therefore, I'm praying for deliverance in this case. You know, even as I think of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he was seen in Revelation 1.18, He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen? And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Who has the keys? He has the keys. He's the one who determines when you die. In fact, he also is the one who determines ultimately how you die. In fact, in 2 Peter 1, verse 14, Peter says, knowing that surely I must put off my tent, this earthly body, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. You say, when did the Lord Jesus Christ show him that he was going to die and even how he was going to die? Well, Peter is referring here back to John 21, verses 17 through 22. Where after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and before his ascension into heaven, He said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Notice, he recognizes Jesus Christ was omniscient. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, now catch this, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. 
What death? By way of crucifixion. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? That's John. Following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and had said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? This is clearly John. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? What about John? You told me I'm going to die. I'm going to die by crucifixion. What about him? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Get your nose out of his business. You just follow me. Now we see through this that we are prone to want to get our nose in other people's business and issues that only the Lord can really resolve. And the fact of the matter is, God is the one who determines whether we're going to live till Christ returns or whether we're going to die in the meantime and even how we're going to die. And while God does not divulge this information to us as he did to John, yet the principle is the same. How we die is sovereignly determined by the Lord, whether it be a car accident, whether it be a plane crash, whether we be murdered, which obviously isn't his perfect will, but he does permit sin to take its course, whether it be of old age, or whether we not experience death at all and are raptured, which again is far better. God is the one who ultimately determines when we die and how we die. But this raises other questions, like what about the death of babies? What about the death of babies? Now let me make it clear, there's no place in the Bible like limbo. I was taught that as a Roman Catholic, that unbaptized babies went to limbo. You know, when I was growing up in the 60s, that was a dance, I think, you know. And I will devote our study this Wednesday night and next Sunday to this very topic and how to deal with the death of a baby, a child, a stillborn, and so forth. So I'm not going to develop this today, but I simply want to state this. Babies are young children who die before they reach an age or condition where they are accountable for believing the gospel, are saved at the point of death by the grace of God. Now remember, children are born sinners and they need to be saved. And Christ died for their sins in order to save them. But when they haven't reached an age where they could either accept or reject Jesus Christ, I believe the Bible is replete with various verses that lead us to the conclusion that at the point of death, God in his mercy saves that unaccountable child. And so we will develop this, like I said, looking at verses and such on Wednesday night and next Sunday as well. But what about, number two, out-of-body, death-like experiences? And we hear a lot about this in the movies and books and TV shows today. And, you know, I... D I had an out-of-body experience, I almost died, I saw a light, I saw a tunnel, I saw this, I saw that. What do you say to things like this? And by the way, when someone asks you about this, you don't have to give them an answer. You know, but you do need to understand this. These are experiences of dying people, not dead people. That's why you know what they are. We must base our faith on the Word of God, not another's experiences. Consider 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6. And I refer to that because Paul says, I knew a man in Christ, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows that such a one was caught up into the third heaven. He was caught up into paradise. He was allowed to see visions and revelations that was not lawful for him to utter. So God did not allow Paul to share what he saw in heaven. But this apparently is unlike those of today who claim that they can share it. In fact, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet him that he wouldn't get proud about this, these revelations that he had seen. But we have those in our day going around, like Don Piper, who writes a book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, a true story of death and life. No, not to be outdone, Bill Wise wrote a book, 23 Minutes in Hell, a New York Times bestseller. 
which I think is very unwise. The problem, again, is it's all based in someone's conflicting experience instead of based upon the word of the living God. Dr. Charles Ryries writes, and I quote, in some instances, the reports furnish false information about the other side. The light which some saw was variously identified, and the identifications were conditioned by the person's religious upbringing. There was a culture of stamp to the visions. Most Americans saw loved ones. Most Indians saw religious figures. Religion determined the identity of the figure. No Christian patient saw a Hindu deity, and no Hindu saw Jesus. Furthermore, the reports almost universally eliminate any reference to torment or hell. And generally, the reports promote universalism. God will eventually save everyone, for example, Dr. George Ritchie, a psychiatrist and a Presbyterian who had an out-of-body experience, reported that it changed his conventional views on heaven and hell. He said, I saw no hellfire, no heads rolling in the streets. I know beyond a doubt that the Christ I saw will accept everyone, good or bad, even those who didn't believe in him. Dr. Kubler-Ross of, of the grieving death Syndrome, renowned for this, reported that her research never included, quote, a judgmental God. And yet we know that there's a hell to be saved from and a heaven to be saved too. But this is the problem when you base your faith on anything less than the Word of God. Another question, what about dying grace for believers? Does God provide grace at that point of death in order to go through that situation with victory, as it were, with peace in our souls and so forth. And let me just remind you how God provides saving grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. He provides living grace, as he says, my grace is sufficient for you in the trials that you are going through, as well as dying grace. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of a shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God's grace will be there when you need it. By the way, he does not give grace in advance. Ask Stephen, ask Moses, ask Paul. In fact, how do you explain martyrs like John Huss or Jan Hus? who's being burnt at the stake, and while he's being burnt at the stake, he's singing hymns to the Lord. And I think God gave dying grace. I don't know that he even felt the flames. I do know this, though. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this God, our God, forever and ever, he will be our guide even to death. So we've looked at what about the death of babies, out-of-body, death-like experiences, dying grace. Here's another one people ask about what about suicide? What about suicide? And suicide is sin. The Bible is very clear about that. You do not have a right to take your own life. You therefore usurp God's authority by doing so. Suicide is sin, and believers are capable of any sin in the catalog of sin, including the sin of suicide. In fact, if I recall correctly, there's about six or seven examples of suicide in the Bible. At least two or three of them are believers who committed suicide. But even the sin of suicide was paid for by Christ on the cross as he died for all of our sins. And forgiven when a sinner believes in Christ as he forgives us all trespasses. Thus not even the sin of suicide can separate a believer from the love of God so as to lose his eternal salvation. In fact, that's why Paul says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death unqualified, any kind of death, even suicide, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other Creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And while it's the epitome of, su- of selfishness in ways to commit suicide and a terrible testimony that communicates hopelessness instead of the hope we have in Christ, even when it comes to suicide, this cannot separate us from the love of God as believers. Now what about funerals? Again, funerals are biblical. There are many examples of them in Scripture. And they provide a great opportunity to preach the gospel, comfort the saved, and convict the lost while bringing some sense of closure for people. We see an example of Abraham buying a cave so that he could bury the body of Sarah. And then Isaac and Ishmael attending and burying Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. excuse me, Abraham in the cave of Machpelah. And Jacob burying his mother, and Jacob burying Rachel, and Esau and Jacob met and buried their father Isaac. And we see Joseph giving very clear instructions about his funeral. And by the way, let me just say this. When someone has given you instructions about his funeral, you need to follow those instructions. You need to follow them. You may not agree with them, and you need to follow them. You say, well, okay, I can see here that we see funerals in the Bible. We see burials in the Bible. And burials, by the way, are the norm that we see in the Bible. But what about about cremation? What about cremation? And cremation's become uh, an option that many people are considering in our day. And let me just say this, though the burial of the body is the biblical norm, the Bible does not mandate and burial of the body. Thus, cremation falls under the area of personal liberty and conscience in which each believer must choose and be persuaded what the Lord would have them to do. Now again, many believers or people opt primarily due to the financial side of this. But Romans 14 says in areas of liberty, who are you to judge another servant to his own master he stands or fall? Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. And if you're convinced to do cremation, that's between you and the Lord. Personally, I prefer burial, and that's how I'm planning to go, unless the Lord comes, which would be far better. A seventh question is what about deathbed salvation? Is it possible to be saved at the last moment of your life? And the answer is, it is possible to be saved at any time before death. And some trust Christ at the last moment. Remember the thief on the cross. A great illustration of deathbed conversion, as both thieves initially reviled our Lord, one changed his mind and he said, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. In fact, this past year, we saw here at Duluth Bible Church four deathbed conversions in a two-week period involving relatives of believers from our church who died within, or were saved within minutes or hours or days of their death. Now, here's one thing you have to factor in, though. One, you don't always know when you're going to die, nor your relatives. Number two, in light of dementia, in light of Alzheimer's and so forth in our day, a person may lose their opportunity to believe even before they die. That's why now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Our next question, where do you find comfort when someone dies? And let me say, you find it ultimately from the Lord and the promises of God. But remember, God does use people who pray for you, who show their care for you, and who remind you of God's promises to be instruments of comfort. You know, where people are really going to find comfort is in the Lord here. It's in his word. It's in knowing his character, in knowing that Jesus does all things well. But God does use people. And if we're going to be used, we need to be wise about this. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, here's what we read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
He's the Father of mercies. Notice plural. And he's the God of all comfort. He's the ultimate source of comfort. And this God comforts us in all our tribulation. Why? And here we see a purpose clause again. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. It doesn't have to be the exact one we're going through. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, as you've gone through the death of a loved one, you've gone through a trying situation, and through it, the Lord has drawn you closer to him and taught you some promises. God then wants to use you to be a source of comfort to others as an instrument in his hand. But remember what Job said in Job 16, 1 and 2, all miserable comforters you are. And I don't know if I allowed space in your handout for this as I just added it this morning. But let me just mention seven lessons from Job's comforters. And I'm going to do this very quickly. Number one, remember that you may not have all the facts they didn't. Be very slow to judge in those situations. Because you don't have all the facts. Job's comforters didn't and they arrived at wrong conclusions. Number two, recognize a place for undeserved suffering. They didn't. They concluded that Job was suffering due to his own sin. Something was wrong in Job's life. Therefore, he got what was coming to him. And while we live in a society that is prone to not take human responsibility, we also, on the other hand, must recognize undeserved suffering. Number three, don't fault God. His will is best, though at times mysterious. Remember, Job did not charge God foolishly. Job did not sin with his lips. And in the time of death, don't fault God, because his will is best. He's a good God. He's ex- his will is acceptable and perfect. Fourthly, give people time to grieve. God did with Job. God didn't immediately move in to comfort him. He gave him time to grieve, in this case, and you need to give people time to grieve, especially the more horrific, the more difficult the death, the more deeper the grieving process oftentimes. Number five, don't feel like you have to have all the answers. Job 13, 15, Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You see, God didn't ask us to be all-knowing. He asked us to trust him. And we don't always know why he's doing what he's doing. We just know all things are working together for good. Number six, remember that God has a purpose in this and where real comfort is found. Remember Job 23, 10 says, He knows the way that I take, and when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And I esteemed his word more important, and I treasured it more than my necessary food. That's what's important in a time of loss. And number seven, when someone is not snapping out of grief, should be grief there, ask them wise questions to get them to start thinking and relating to the Lord. In fact, in Job 38 through 42, I haven't counted how many times God asked a question But he asked it over and over again to Job. Why? To quit just tying into your feelings and start thinking and start relating the situation to God and his word. These are some lessons from Job's comforters we would do well to learn. But this leads us to another question. What is the last item to be destroyed on God's agenda? What's the last item to be destroyed on God's agenda? And the answer is clearly the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, is death. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, we read that this corruption must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, so shall be swallowed up the same. O death, where is your victory? It ends in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, dear friends, Jesus Christ has taken the sting out of death. It reminds me of the story M.R. DeHaan tells about how he was with his two children, and on one occasion, one of his sons was stung by a bee. And that bee started buzzing around the other son, and he told the other son, don't worry, you have nothing to fear. 
He says, why not, Dad? That bee's coming right by me. And he took his other son and showed him the stinger implanted in his skin. And he said, because this, your brother, has taken this stinger, that bee only has one stinger to give, that you're fine. And in the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ has taken our stinger. He's died for our sins. He's paid for it completely. And he's rose from the dead. He's taking the sting out of death for the believer so that we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt where we're going to spend eternity. Which leads us to our last question. Where will you spend eternity when you die? Now, frankly, planning your funeral is good. Providing for your family financially is good. And many things we talked about today are good, but this is really the bottom line, isn't it? There's a hell to be saved from and a heaven to be saved to, and the only answer is our Lord Jesus Christ. And what you think about Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross will determine where you spend eternity. He that believes in Christ is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Remember, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And by the way, as I think of that very verse again, and as I think of the dead-end streets in front of us, those staircases that ultimately go nowhere, I can't help but think about religion. Religion that cannot save you, as only Jesus Christ can save you. And thus today I offer to you, by way of the gospel, a Savior who was crucified for your sins and who rose from the dead, who gives eternal life to all who simply put their faith in him alone. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? That can be settled even right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful word and these truths that we have considered today. Thank you that you have spoken and you have not stuttered. You have made it very clear what you have to say about the fact that life is short, death is certain, eternity is long. And yet what good news you offer to us in the gospel, how the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again to save us to forgive us, to redeem us, to give us eternal life, all as a gift of your grace, which becomes ours the moment we put our faith in him alone. And if there's anyone here, Father, who's not been saved, may today be the day that they make that decision to trust in your son and what he did for them. And those of us who are saved, may we redeem the time. May we not fall asleep. May we Number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And when we make the needed preparation even for our death, we would pray. Because we need not fear it. We need not be afraid to face it. We can do it victoriously, knowing that Jesus Christ has won the victory for us. We thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Eight seven in the hymn book, please. Ladies will have you on stanza three. Men will have you on stanza four. Everyone on one, two, and five. The promises of God believed bring strength. Strength brings stability. Stability brings the ability to stand. Stand, therefore, and let's sing together. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, 
standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that can't everyone fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Ladies. Thank you, everyone. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Guys, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to him eternally by love's strong pour, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Everyone, standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all and all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. May it be so. Thank you. You're dismissed.